Hi, everyone, and welcome to this evening's interviewing for the Health Professions Workshop. I'm Dr. Amanda Dye. I'm the Director of Advising and Programs at Beyond Barnard, and we are here today to talk a little bit about interviewing. This is a part of an application cycle that sometimes causes a lot of consternation or um, uh, feelings of anxiety for folks, but I think that interviewing is the most exciting part of application processes, and I want to share with you a little bit about why I think that is and how I think you can best prepare. So the goals for this evening are to think, first of all, about why interviews are part of health professions, programs, application processes to start with. Um, think about how to prepare for the interview day. And we're talking about question prep, but also how to prepare your visual presentation and your technology as necessary. And then at the end, we'll save some time for Q&A to discuss your questions about upcoming interviews. So. We'll get started with some interview basics. Um, so thinking about things like medical and dental school interviews, it's important to reflect on why they're used. You know, it's a it's a very, um, very common practice among health professions programs. It would be very strange, I think, for a health professions program not to require an interview. And that's because schools are really interested in aspects of you as an applicant that aren't as visible simply from your application, right? Um, schools are interested in your interpersonal and particularly your verbal communication skills. They wanna be able to assess your maturity, your level of judgment through these questions. And they wanna give you a chance to maybe expand on some of the things you've written about in your application and hopefully to get, you, to get, to get to know you a little bit better on a personal level, right? To not just be looking at a person on a page, but really a, a whole human being and understanding a little bit about who you are your goals and priorities. I think it's also really important for applicants to remember that interviews are really crucial to you um, in terms of developing your understanding of these programs and assessing whether or not a program is a good fit for you. Uh, by and large, I find that people do have pretty positive experiences with these interviews, which is great, but I have certainly worked with students in the past who have had an interview with the program and then realized later, actually, I thought that school was a, a really high priority for me, but the interview process showed me that another school is probably a much better fit for my needs individually. Um, so it's a two-way street, right? You and the school are both looking for the right fit, and, uh, and the interview really is a crucial part of assessing that. Most health professions programs use uh, a few different formats of interviews. So a traditional interview, when I use that word, I typically mean a one-on-one -on -one interview. You know, you, the interviewee, and maybe a faculty member from the school, maybe a current student. A lot of schools use fourth-year students to um uh, to help round out their admissions committees. You might be meeting with a director or an assistant director of admissions, so an administrator in the school. Um, all of those are possibilities. Some schools allow their interviewers to have access to applications beforehand, and some don't. They'll often tell applicants this. So a school that offers you an interview might say that um, the interviewer will have access to all or some of your application. For example, sometimes schools don't give grades or test scores to their interviewers because that's not something that they're interested in having the interviewers evaluate. It's not relevant for the purpose of the interview. Um, sometimes schools use a completely closed file, meaning they don't give the interviewer anything, maybe your name, uh, probably your name, um, but they don't give any other contextual information about you. So you're kind of starting from scratch and you're having a conversation with someone who hasn't read your materials. There are schools that use what's known as a panel interview. And that's really similar to a traditional interview. It's just more interviewers. So a school might have two or three people involved in a conversation with you rather than just one, otherwise pretty similar. Um, the other format that has, I think, grown a lot in popularity over the past couple of decades is what's known as the multiple mini interview format. This is uh, commonly used at, uh, at a lot of medical schools actually, as well as some other health professions programs. And an MMI interview is not like an interview that you may have had before. So, you know, when we think of a traditional interview, often you're going to be asked questions about yourself and to reflect on your past experiences and maybe to draw specifically from a previous experience to talk about a time when you did a particular thing. 
An MMI is um, a situational interview. So you'd be given a prompt before you start the session. Usually you get a specific amount of time, two minutes is pretty standard, to read the prompt and prepare before you enter the station to talk to the person on the other side. You might have um, a question that you know, provides you with a situation and asks you to say how you would behave if you were one of the people in the scenario. So you could be asked um, about a situation where you're you're supposed to be responding as if you are a physician or if you are responding as if you are a parent in a particular dynamic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some schools use other kinds of activities in MMI. Sometimes there are group stations where you might be given a task to complete with other applicants, and that's about assessing you know, your group communication skills. Um, so there are lots of different ways to do this, but the virtue of the MMI is that you go through a bunch of stations, so you're meeting with and being evaluated by a bunch of people. And uh, a lot of schools use, I mean, six to 10 is a, is a decent range. I would say eight, eight-ish, seven or eight is, is a pretty common number for these schools. Um, and the good thing for you as an applicant is most schools kind of take out the, the, um, the, the scores on the, on the upper end, lower end, right? So if you have a score uh, that is really, really much lower than the others, it's not gonna affect the actual evaluation of your application um, because MMIs are intended to try to minimize that like interpersonal bias in evaluation from, uh, from interviewers. Some schools have decided that they want the best of both worlds and they do a hybrid of some MMI stations um, and then maybe a station where you're doing questions that are more like a traditional interview. If you are uh, interviewing with a medical program, an MD program, you can use the MSAR, um, which is linked here uh, at the bottom, to find the specific interview format for each school that you have applied to. So you can already know kind of what to expect from each of the programs. Um, most medical schools are still using virtual interviews, MD programs in particular. Um, typically, they are conducted live, so you would be in a Zoom or a similar platform with an interviewer in the virtual room um, and, uh, you know, offer you the availability to, uh, to answer questions and ask your own questions. Um, some schools may use a, a first step of an asynchronous interview. So you could be invited to complete a recorded interview. Usually it's pretty short, three to five questions, um, where you're not going to be interacting with an interviewer, but you'll be presented with questions and given a specific time frame to record your responses and share with the school. Sometimes schools will do that before they decide whether to offer an additional interview later. Um, okay. So I want to talk now a little bit about how one can prepare for all of these interviews. Um, and I think the first thing that I always want to encourage folks to do, if you receive an invitation to interview with the health professions program is to celebrate that. Um, the biggest jump in this process is from application to interview, right? Um, most schools are interviewing five to 10% of their applicants. So getting an interview itself means that the school thinks you are a strong applicant. The school thinks you are a viable applicant for their program. They already like you, which is really good news for you. Um, the next thing is to communicate with the school in as timely a manner as you can. They'll provide you with them with instructions on how to schedule. And you'll see that different schools do their interview scheduling in very different ways. None of, none of them are exactly the same. Um, so I would say just be careful to read the instructions that you get. Um, you are often going to be able to make your own schedule selections. Lots of schools use like some sort of a, a software platform to allow you to pick a date and time. Um, so make sure if you are scheduling, right, that you schedule for yourself as soon as you can. So you have the, the widest availability of dates and that you're thinking about other commitments, right? You know, not scheduling right before a huge deadline at work or um, on the same day as a midterm. Um, trying to have a little bit of a gap between interviews, you know, if you're able to. Sometimes you can't do it in the most ideal way, but thinking about all of your other commitments when you're scheduling is definitely key. Uh, you should try to get as much information as you can in terms of the interview format. Um, there are some schools these days that are using in-person interviews. A lot of osteopathic medical schools have gone back to offering um, uh, in-person interviews. And so you can you know, decide whether an in-person interview is something that you're able to travel to, if that's an option. 
Otherwise, you're going to want to learn about which platform uh, the school uses for virtual interviews, how many interview conversations you're going to have and what the type might look like, the length of time. Some schools will say, hey, it's going to be 30 minutes. That's the maximum. Other schools will say 30 to 60 minutes. It could be a longer conversation. Um, they may give you some information about the kinds of questions that you should prepare for. And um, it's helpful to understand a little bit about how interviews are assessed. So um, the school may say in their, their outreach about interviews kind of a little bit about um, how the interview fits into the application process. Many times schools also have this information in their admissions web pages. So they'll often have a section on their admissions process, the components of it, and they may provide some info there about kind of what the interview means for them individually. You want to plan what to wear. Even if you are interviewing virtually, you want to look professional um, and you want to feel like you are doing something professional, right? So having um, professional attire on is important. Healthcare professions, as you have probably learned already, typically are, are fairly conservative when it comes to dress, especially in um, it, in with regard to roles that that interact with patients. So suits are very common, but they are not obligatory. You can do a blouse and trousers and a skirt or, or a dress with or without a jacket. You know, you want to think about presenting professionally, but also presenting as comfortably as you can. It's totally fine to use color and to accessorize. You know, it doesn't have to just be black or gray. Um, it could be, you know, more expressive of your personality, but it's really important to minimize distractions. So things like jewelry that's like really noisy or jangly, or if you know you have an earring that's always getting caught on your collar, not that, right? Um, kind of minimizing the distractions for you as well as the interviewer and, if you are buying new clothes, which I think uh, interviews are a great excuse to do, um, be comfortable in them, test wear them, you know, get, make sure that, you know, you can, you can, you can go in them without, you know, pulling at things or, um, or feeling uncomfortable while you're sitting in front of your, your interview setup. Speaking of which, you want to get ready with your technology. Um, a stable internet connection is really important for virtual interviews. And honestly, if you can do a wired connection, it can really help. Wi-Fi, you know, as we all know, is, uh, is very tricky sometimes with video calls. It's good to test your connection speed and to test your webcam and the microphone the morning of your interview. So making sure, you know, nothing has gone wrong since the last time you used them. It's also great to identify the quietest place that you can to conduct your interview. Um, there, are, if you're a current student, you know there are rooms on campus that you can um, that you can reserve. But you can also do interviews from home very easily. Schools also know that you know people are not always in a situation where they live alone and can have a fully quiet space. So do your best. You know, um, make sure that the background is not super busy. You know, they're not people walking around behind you or um, a very messy room behind you and um, and try recording yourself in advance just so that you can see with your setup what it looks like on the other end. Um, you can also investigate possibilities for interview accommodations if you need them. So for example, if on a video call using captions would really help you, um, then you can uh, reach out to the school before your interview and talk to them about getting uh using that in in their their interview platform if you're not sure how it works um before the interview it's good to review everything that you've submitted to the school so if you've applied to a medical school you've probably submitted both a primary and secondary application review all those responses um anything could come up in an interview you never know uh, sometimes you've written about a hobby and an interviewer has the same one and they might want to talk about it. Sometimes you've written about an experience that, that you did a few years ago and you want to refresh yourself to remember, you know, exactly what you highlighted in your application. It's also good to think about a basic structure for responses to frequent questions. I always talk about this in the form of mental bullet points. So thinking, you know, if I'm asked, tell me about yourself, what are the three two or three key things that I want the interviewer to take away from this response that I kind of want to uh, to set the tone for the interview, right? Um, so I might think about talking about a couple of things that are that I think are really important to understanding my candidacy candidacy overall. 
you don't want to over rehearse. So you don't want to fully script out all of your responses. And you definitely don't want to be reading scripted responses in an interview. But it's helpful to think through, you know, the, the main points that you know you want to make in the conversation and some examples that might help you illustrate those things. It's great if you can have stories from important experiences that can be useful in multiple contexts. Um, examples of you know, previous experiences with interpersonal components are very often helpful because interview questions can often um, really center on things like you know, how you interact with other people. Uh, it's a really important part of, of being in the health professions. Sometimes schools do use questions about healthcare policy. And I think a lot of times people feel really nervous about getting questions like that. Um, these are big questions. These are questions that don't have easy answers. So you shouldn't feel like you need to be able to say to someone in an interview setting and, you know, in the space of a minute, exactly how we fix healthcare in the United States. That's not a problem that anybody can solve in, in that le uh, length of time. However, you can be aware of what's going on in uh, discussions about health policy at the national level or at your local level. Um, you can be aware of the the big debates, and you can have a position of your own on those those uh, those issues. So I always encourage folks, you know, pick a publication um, or two that does coverage of uh, of healthcare and just follow that section. You know, make make it a point to read every day. What are the headlines? Um, and uh, and doing that maybe at the national and then more at the local level can be really helpful when you're, uh, especially if you're preparing for an interview where a school is, is very embedded in a local community. You should always be prepared to answer questions about, you know, your interest in your intended profession. They could come in lots of forms. So sometimes people, you know, I think people get really worried about the why medicine, why dentistry question. Um, you might not get it in exactly those words. So you want to make sure that you're able to communicate about your interest in healthcare broadly, but also in the specific profession that you're uh, pursuing. You want to think about the experiences that you've had that have helped you to be sure that this interest is the right career path for you. And again, um, thinking through how experiences can, can have multiple lenses on that question. Um, you want to think about the service, research, and extracurricular activities that have been important to you that really illustrate your core values and goals. Um, like I said, your views on uh, healthcare related issues. You could get a question that is completely unrelated to healthcare. Tell me about a book that you read recently that you really enjoyed and why, you know? So being prepared to be flexible um, is, is very helpful. And a school could still potentially ask you about experiences during COVID-19, um, especially if you were a college student during that time. There's a link here and uh, folks will, you'll get the uh, a PDF of these slides, um, but you, you'll be able to see a list of some sample questions there. A few of them I've kind of pulled out here. Um, so common question types, uh, behavioral questions. So these are uh, questions that ask you about things that you've already done in the past. Um, so for example, uh, a question asking you to talk about an encounter you've had with a patient that informed your career goals that made you really sure you wanted to be a dentist, for example. Um, a time that you experienced a challenge and how you handled it. Uh, those are questions where it's really good to have examples from those previous experiences. Uh, general questions that are a little bit more about you, the person. Um, those are things like the tell me about yourself question. You might be asked about how you chose to go to Barnard or why you chose your particular major. Um, what sparked your interest in medicine, dentistry, nursing, et cetera. Um, you might be asked a little bit about why you're applying to that particular program. Um, all very common kinds of questions. And then situational questions are kind of you're given a scenario and asked to project how you might behave. So we're not talking about behavior in the past, but what you think you would do in a particular situation. These, as I mentioned before, are very commonly used in MMI interviews. So you might be uh, given a scenario like imagine you're a physician whose patient refuses a recommended treatment. What would you do? In MMI, usually you get a lot, a little bit more context. You usually get like a paragraph. Um, or it might be a question that isn't overtly about a healthcare setting. So for example, the second question here, what would you do if you're asked to perform a task for which you had not been trained? Um, so of course that applies to the healthcare context, but that also applies to lots of other contexts as well. Sometimes questions can evoke emotionally challenging topics. 
I know lots of folks, you know, have traced their interest in healthcare to really tough experiences. Maybe sometimes their own challenges with health, sometimes maybe the loss of someone that's really close to them. And bringing up that sort of stuff in an interview can be really, really hard, especially if it's, you know, an experience that is, uh, that's one that you're still dealing with. So if you know that you've maybe written about something in your application that makes you a little misty when you bring it up, it's good to practice talking about it first. You know, practice talking about it with people who know you, people who already know a little bit of the story, so you don't have to, um, you know, feel like you're starting from scratch. And, uh, and just, you know, I think getting that practice of actually saying the words out loud sometimes helps to, to, uh, to remove the charge from them in particular ways. You should try to center your responses to these questions on how the experience, you know, informs why you're in that interview, right? So maybe not focusing on all of the like individual personal impacts of it, but really thinking about how, you know, this particular experience helped you to better understand your career interests. If a tear comes out, don't worry. You know, interviewers are humans you're a human, it's okay. It's just important to be in control, right? Like you don't want to fully break down. Um, but if, if there's a sniffle, it's not going to negatively affect the person's uh, and evaluation of you. Other kinds of tough questions are very different. Things like sometimes a, an interviewer could ask you, this grade doesn't look like all the other grades on your transcript. What happened there? Um, or some other thing that's maybe, you know, maybe something that you're not as happy with in your application. And that happens for a variety of reasons. Sometimes schools are trying to stress you out a little bit and see if you keep your calm. Um, sometimes they might actually have a genuine question about it. You never know. I think with, um, with issues like that, it's important to just be honest, not try to make excuses, but also to respond from a growth mindset. So to talk about what you learned, um, changes that you made as a result of that experience. It has happened in the past. I don't like it, and lots of other pre-health advisors don't like it, but it does happen that interviewers could ask you where else you're applying. And that puts applicants in a tough position, right? Because you don't want to disclose too much information. That's information that the interviewer actually would never have access to otherwise um, if, they, if they didn't ask you to do it. Um, so I usually encourage people to take a, a, a calm and sort of like, a, roundabout tack with this question and ask as if you answer as if you were asked how you went about choosing schools. So to say kind of like what features are in common with the programs that you are applying to. I've been really excited to apply to programs that have very strong connections to community health and are really, really integrated in the communities that they're part of. I'm also really excited to be part of a medical school community that allows me to do global ex ex health experiences, whatever, you know, whatever is relevant for you. If the interviewer further presses you for specific schools, you could decide whether you want to name any, um, or just to say, I'd prefer not to list specific schools and, uh, and you know, end the conversation or, or that part of the conversation there. When you're working with situational questions, it can be tougher, right? Because you're not just drawing on your own individual experiences. You're trying to think through uh, an experience that you maybe have never had before, actually. Um, so there are some ethical principles here to keep in mind. These are the four basic principles of bioethics, um, autonomy, respecting the rights of individuals to make their own choices, beneficence, doing good, non-maleficence, avoiding causing harm, and justice, promoting fairness. Um, so if you get an ethical dilemma in, for example, an MMI, the likelihood is that two or more of these principles are going to come into conflict, right? So beneficence and autonomy come into conflict when a physician says, here's the treatment, and the patient says, I don't want to do that treatment, right? And you have to then think about, okay, how do you navigate that? If you're asked as the physician, how do you navigate that situation? That's your task as the interviewee. It's also good for MMI type questions to practice with the timing. So like I said before, usually you get about two minutes to read the prompt and start thinking through your response. And you may have somewhere between like five and 10 minutes to actually talk to the interviewer in the physical or virtual room. Um, it can, it's a long time. It's a long time to talk actually, if you are uh, you know, just kind of on your own there. Different schools have different 
perspectives on this. Um, some schools don't allow the interviewer to really interact much, maybe like some basic follow-up questions, but not a, not a full conversation. Other schools, it's very different. The MMI interviewer is allowed to have a conversation with you and kind of follow your line of thinking with you. Um, so you want to make sure that you understand kind of uh, going into it what, what you're expecting. Um, as you're structuring your answer, thinking about the prompts from multiple angles, um, thinking about every stakeholder in the situation and how one party's decisions impact others. It's okay with these questions to acknowledge complexity or ambiguity, right? If you get a prompt and you see as you're reading it that actually there's a piece of information missing here, it's important for you as the interviewee to point out, one of the things that I really need to know before I make an affirmative decision is this, if it's X, then I would do this. If it's Y, then I would do this. And with these kinds of questions, rational and ethical reasoning is key, right? These are scenarios that could have multiple correct responses or multiple reasonable responses. What the school is looking for is the logic and, um, and, and the decision-making process that you can describe through your answer. So don't worry about being like ultimately right because these kind the, the kinds of situations that you'll you'll encounter are things where you know there's not a single right way to do things and finally before you interview compile your own list of questions for the school even if they use an mmi they may give you like a um a station where you have a more traditional interview type question or they could invite you to a group session like an info session with a member of the admissions committee or something like that um, or students, it's great to have a question or two in your pocket in case you're able to ask one. So with that in mind, it's good to take a look at the school website, try to avoid questions that are pretty basic and, and are answered there. Try to think of questions for different people. So questions for faculty and questions for students could actually be really different. And um, I think student interviewers are actually really fantastic because they asking, asking them questions often yields a lot of really important information for applicants. Um, there are a couple of links here for uh, a little a sheet from the AAMC that helps um, kind of structure uh, keeping a record of your questions. There's also a list of 35 questions current student students wish they'd asked at interviews so so to kind of give you um a little bit of a a, a set of ideas um and if you're interviewing, you know, um, having a little notepad with you and jotting down some notes about questions you have if they arise organically in the interview is also fantastic. Okay, um, the la the next two are are fairly quick, so we'll go through what to do on the day of the interview and then uh, after an interview, and we'll have time for questions. So, on the day of the interview, like I said before, make sure you allow time. Check out your technology, make sure your connection, everything is working. If you're using your personal computer, turn off all non-essential programs, close the windows, turn off your notifications. You don't want anything dinging when you're answering questions. Try to light yourself from the front. You can move a lamp. It doesn't have to be a fancy thing. Um, try to position your camera at eye level and make sure that you're looking into the camera as you're speaking. It's okay to look at the speaker's eyes when they're talking, especially if your camera is sort of at a similar um, similar orientation. Um, make sure that you have contact information for either the interviewer or the admissions office itself handy, just in case something happens. You know, the connection drops on the other side. You might connect, um, contact the admissions office to let them know and to ask them, you know, what should happen next. It's good to have your phone nearby, but keep it on silent. Again, no noises, no distractions, and make sure that your device is fully charged or is plugged in. Do not want uh, a power failure during the middle of an interview. You'll probably be a little bit nervous on the day of the interview, and that happens to most people. It's I think pretty natural. Um, but remember, your interviewers have been in your shoes. <laughs> I mean, they're all people who have done lots of interviews themselves in the past. And they're also people who know the high stakes of these interviews in particular. I find by and large that interviewers really do try to make the day a pleasant experience for interviewees. They're not trying to upset you or scare you. Um, and remember, they already like your application. You know, like I said before, they haven't, they've offered you an interview because they like what they saw. You know, they want to talk to you. That's why you're there. So you want to talk to them. They want to talk to you. 
and put them together, you know, it's nice. It's okay if you take a moment to think before responding, if you get a question and you're like, I have never considered that in my entire life. It's okay to just take a pause, think for a second and say, okay, you know, then go launch into your response. Um, if you're doing multiple interviews in the same day, make sure you're taking advantage of breaks. You know, if you've got a couple of hours between interviews and you can eat lunch, eat lunch. Don't, you know, don't stay hungry. Um, keep water with you, stay hydrated. Um, you know, make sure that you have like taken your medication. If you need to make sure that you have slept as well as you possibly can, all of those kinds of things. When you meet an interviewer, it's, a good practice to inter uh, to introduce yourself and to address them by their title and last name. So, um, you know, you introduce yourself to me, hello, Dr. Dai, right? Um, unless they tell you otherwise. If the interviewer says, no, it's, it's Amanda, then you use their first name. Um, it's okay to, you know, ease into the conversation by talking about pleasantries. In the old days, when I used to interview students uh, in person before the pandemic, it was always like, oh, how was your trip to New York? Blah, 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 you know, those sorts of things. Um, so it's okay to, you know, kind of ease into things. It's also okay to leave some pauses when you're speaking, right? You don't have to fill all of the space. You can respond to a question and wait for the interviewer to react. And in fact, you know, most interviewers really want to have a conversation. Um, if your interviewer offers to be in touch with you individually, say thank you and follow up with them promptly, right? Get their contact info and follow up with them in the days following your interview um, and stay in touch with that person. Uh, some interviewers could ask you challenging questions. They could ask you to follow up on your initial answers. That's not because they're be because they're being critical or because they're judging you. It may be because they want to see how you react, right? They want to understand your thought process processes and your ability to kind of remain calm under pressure rather than like ultimately the response itself. It's also okay to ask for clarification if you don't understand a question. And, um, you know, an interviewer is usually very happy to rephrase or things like that. You should expect questions to differ depending on the interviewer's background. If you end up interviewing some with somebody who is in a field that you've done research in for a few years, they're probably going to want to talk about the research, right? Um, if you are interviewing with somebody who has like a personal uh, connection to you, right? Maybe somebody who also went to Barnard or um, is from the same place that you're from in the world. Those are the kinds of things that often come up because people look for commonalities. If you know your interviewer's names ahead of time, you can look them up. Um, LinkedIn is one place. If they are a, uh, a physician, they're probably going to have a profile on the hospital website or like the medical school website. Um, so seeing, you know, what you can find there, um, keep in mind that sometimes there are last minute changes and that will have nothing to do with you. This is just the nature of things. If, uh, you know, if an admissions committee interviewer is a surgeon, and a surgery takes longer than expected, there may be a last minute substitution. It just happens. It's not not, not anything that is uh, uh, affecting you, I think. Um, interviewers do receive training, but training looks different for every individual school. Sometimes schools give a list of questions that they want folks to ask. Sometimes they give a set of like, ideas that they want their interviewers to explore. And of course, they're given question, they're given training on um, appropriate questioning. Many admissions committees ask their, um, their interviewers to do like implicit bias training and other kinds of things. Um, so there's a lot of awareness that like, hey, you know, people are, people are different and people may interpret questions in various ways, all that sort of stuff. If, unfortunately, you think you've been asked a question that's inappropriate, you know, maybe about um, a protected category status or something like that, you know, your marital status, for example, I'm not supposed to ask about that in a professional interview. Um, you can inform an admissions officer on the day or email the admissions office, you know, um, quickly after, and you can get in touch with me as well. And we can brainstorm ways. Um, I could say this didn't happen to anybody last year. We didn't have to deal with that. I've actually probably has happened like once in my career doing this. So it's not a common thing at all, but I want you to know I'm here if something weird does happen. If you get an invitation to participate in activities that are not strictly an interview, like an info session or a meet and greet, either virtually or, or in person with um, a, like a, an office on campus or students um, or a virtual tour, do them. 
participate as fully as you possibly can um, because schools will be paying attention and they'll want to see um, how, you know, how you interact with others. For example, sometimes those meetings, those information sessions are like a mandatory part of the application process. And that's because they want to get their interviewees in a group and see how they interact together. Sometimes that makes people very nervous, but I will tell you that you already know how to handle that situation. That's how you act in a seminar. You participate, you listen to other people, you respond to them, you ask thoughtful questions, and you try to build on the insights that other people bring to the dynamic. You are participatory, but you're not overwhelming the conversation. That's all you have to do in those situations. If you're able to travel to the school at some point during the cycle, you know, sometimes after schools admit folks, they'll say, hey, on these days, you are very welcome to come visit campus. I heartily, heartily encourage you to do so if you possibly can. If you're not able to travel to the school for whatever reason, do some research. Uh, learn about the surrounding area. Maybe look to see if there are any Barnard alums who went to school there that you can connect with and talk about their experiences. After an interview, send thank you notes if you're allowed. Um, sometimes admissions offices will say, we don't, we don't, we don't allow that. We don't need it. Thank, we appreciate you. Thank you. Um, but no thank you notes necessary. Oftentimes it's fine. Um, if you have the con contact info of your uh, interview interviewers, you can email them directly. You can also um, send thank you notes to the admissions office uh, to be forwarded to your interviewers. Um, email is very typical. You should not feel pressure to send physical mail. Um, people still occasionally do, and it's very, very sweet. But uh, I think it's actually more effective to do email because it always gets there faster and it's more reliable. Um, continue to respond to communications from the school in a timely manner. If the school sends you anything, respond quickly and enthusiastically. Um, and learn the school's policies on application updates. If they allow application updates, you can send meaningful and infrequent updates as the cycle continues. I also strongly encourage you to keep a record of your impressions and experiences. Like I said before, interviews are a way that most people learn really crucial information about these programs. So writing it down while it's fresh in your mind is so, so important. So you can go back and reflect um, an interview journal. I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big believer in writing things down and, uh, and journaling. If, if a voice note is the way to do it for you, you know, whatever works, but just make sure you're keeping records. Um, and if you get a question that you think is just super interesting and you'd never thought of before, or a question that you know you could have answered better, write it down and work through how you might respond to it again in the future. And remember, you know, Practice mates either perfect or close to perfect. Um, people usually are the most nervous for the earliest interviews. And as the cycle goes along and you go through the process with more schools, you're gonna get more comfortable. So last thoughts here. Um, at Beyond Barnard, keep in mind, students and alums can schedule appointments for interview prep. So you can find appointments with me under pre-health advising. And uh, I only use that appointment type, but you can just put in the notes, you know, I'm preparing for an interview with SUNY Downstate. Um, any information you can add there about like the interview format or particular kinds of questions that you want to practice is very helpful for me. Um, if you want to meet with somebody who's not me, you know, stress yourself out a little bit more and talk to an advisor that you don't know quite as well. Uh, you can also find appointments under career advising um, and interview prep is the appointment type. We've also got some interview resources and Handshake. And um, for current students, there are public speaking and presentation resources available via the Speaking Center that I think are super helpful for folks who are just a little bit nervous about public speaking more generally. And here, uh, again, a few more links, some resources from the AAMC on interviewing overall, as well as specifically a resource on what it's like to do an MMI interview. There's um, an inter a virtual interview guide that AAMC has put together, which I think is a very comprehensive uh, guide to all things having to do with that. Um, ADEA, the Dental School Education Association's tips for virtual interviews are also great. And Columbia's bioethics program, there's a, the master's program in bioethics, has a set of online resources on preparing for MMIs, including a couple of PowerPoints and some recorded presentations that I have encouraged people to use for years. Um, I think they are a fantastic introduction to preparing for MMI, and they're completely free and always available, so definitely check those out. Finally, remember to just be honest 
be professional, be genuine, be engaged in these conversations, um, do your preparation. And then on the day of, be ready to be flexible, you know, be ready to respond to things that you haven't thought of. And to know that if, you know, you speak in a way that's not like the perfect, you know, eloquent um, encapsulation of all of your thoughts, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is, you know, getting your ideas across. And as you do interviews, reflecting on those experiences, thinking about what you've learned about the school and how you feel about it, as well as how you can grow as an interviewee through that experience is incredibly important. And good luck. All right. So that's it for my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing so I can come back. And I know there's, let's see here. Um, so, uh, Folks, if you have questions, you can pop them into the chat or you can raise your hand. You can whatever, you know, it's we're casual here. So um, questions. Also, um, I'll share the slides uh, and the recording of this video with um, all of the folks who are applicants this year, as well as folks who registered for this event. Uh, there's a question in the uh, in the chat about uh, pharmacy. Uh, any tips for going pre-farm? Uh, I mean, so this presentation is specific to interviews. If you're interested in talking a little bit more generally about um, preparing for other health professions, I would encourage you to come to a pre-health overview session later in the semester. Um, these sessions are also in Handshake and uh, the, the same way that you registered for this one. Um, I'm also available for... Um, uh, individual advising appointments to talk about, you know, specific uh, career goals and plans. Any questions about interviews? All right. Well, if no questions, I can hang out for a second uh, if anyone thinks of one. But if no questions, um, then I'll I'll release other folks. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll be happy to share the recording of this uh, either Friday or early next week, as well as the slides. And um, and yeah, uh, these are resources, again, that are general for health professions. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking about applying to, to various um, different kinds of um, of programs, then, you know, there are little individual differences, but a lot of this stuff is, is pretty common across programs. Um, oh, there are a couple questions in the chat now. Um, let's see, one about um, what would be some tricky interview questions in your opinion? Well, I think that really depends on the person, honestly. You know, for some people, uh, tell me about yourself is a really tricky question. I think that there's a good way to answer that, which I shared earlier, right? To think of it as kind of an abstract for the rest of the interview and to think about like, what are the key points you want the person to take away that you want to highlight? Um, sometimes people find health policy type questions very tricky. Um, sometimes a question, um, I mean, sometimes the, the situational questions for MMIs people find uh, very tricky. I think it can vary a lot. Um, so what I would always suggest is, you know, reading lots of possible sample questions and trying to assess for yourself where, um, like where, you feel comfortable and where you see questions that are like, ooh. Um, and then when you uh, identify those kinds of questions that make you think, I have no idea how I would answer that, actually sitting down and starting to think, okay, how would I approach that? Um, and it may take some workshopping, may take some, uh, you know, some uh, writing things down and, you know, uh, before practicing with another person, but that's okay. Um, you know, I, identifying the things that you feel really comfortable talking about is important. And then identifying the things you feel less comfortable talking about and, um, and you know, how you might start responding to those things is also super important. And I've got another question about when to expect interviews after secondaries. This is a really good question that has no answer, unfortunately. So, the, the thing about applying to health professions programs is once you've submitted your materials, you are, you're waiting for the school, right? And even if you have submitted all of your materials as early as humanly possible, different schools have different timelines. If 
one school uses three people to read an application before they make a decision and another school uses four, automatically the second school is going to take longer to, uh, to decide about your application and to offer you an interview. A school could read your application very early and think, we like this, maybe, we're not 100% sure. And, you know, they read your application in August, but they actually offer you an interview in January. So an interview could come at any time, really. I'm sorry, I wish there was a, a better answer, but the schools are, are very individualistic. They're working on their own timelines and they don't, like getting an interview from one school has no predictive power for whether you'll get an interview for another school. It's very, uh, it's, it's very, very individualized at this point. Um, it's good to know that most schools will be offering interviews. I mean, some of you probably have heard from schools. If you haven't yet, um, you know, schools are typically they start offering interviews. I find these days like late July is usually the first, the first kind of contact. And then, um, Interviews typically start in August. A lot of schools will start right around the start of the school year. And most schools will continuously interview through December, you know, right around the typical college winter break time is when they'll they'll often pause. And um, and some schools conclude interviews there. So like NYU is an example that I always use. They're done by December. That's it. So if you've applied to NYU and you haven't heard about an interview offer, um, you know, by November, probably no. Um, but if you've applied to basically most other programs, they could make additional offers later in the cycle as well. So um, I think most schools will offer, um, will interview folks in January, February, sometimes March. Um, and since virtual interviews have started, actually, I've noticed that some schools will interview even later in, in April sometimes. Um, so really the calendars do differ from school to school. I find that um, there are a lot of interview offers happening around this time of year as schools go through like the, the initial pass on all of the applications. And then I often find there's another like sort of slightly smaller peak in offers in January as schools start to fill in their spring calendars. So no news is just no news in this process. <laughs> um, and just be patient. Um, obviously, if, uh, if there are significant changes or updates to your application and a school accepts updates, you can share those, um, but uh, keeping in mind that it's it's not about you; it's about how the schools do these uh, these processes for sure. That's a really good question. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, I appreciate you all for coming to spend an hour of the evening with me. And um, I hope that if you are preparing for interviews, you are excited about them. Keep me updated. Let me know where you're hearing from. And uh, and I'm sure that I will see some of you for interview prep uh, soon, if I haven't already. Uh, have a great rest of your evening, everyone. Enjoy enjoy the, the night. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>